Well, good morning. And, um, you know, I'm sitting up here with some uh, very bright panelists. We've heard some excellent presentations from Kim and Ken and Ed and, and uh, Tim. And um, so how is a common layman like me supposed to uh, figure out where the truth lies? Yes, we're supposed to go to the Bible, and we are all going to the Bible, but we are coming away with differing outcomes. Well, God has promised to help us out, and I believe if he doesn't help us out, we will be helplessly locked in disunity of message. Now, I believe we have unity of spirit, but we're striving for unity of message. Now, here's the help that I'm uh, suggesting. Uh, it's found in Early Writings, page 78. I recommend to you, dear reader, the word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. God has, in that word, promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. We're talking about me, I'm very liable to err from Bible truth. Our pioneers couldn't figure out our doctrines. You know, when a person dies, do they go right to heaven, or what happens? Because they were coming from all different uh, religions, and it was the visions of the last days that helped bring them into unity of message. So we have been trying to come into unity of message for many years, and over these many years, most of us have only become more convinced of the correctness of our positions. Now, if the visions of the last days cannot correct those who err from Bible truth, then we will continue giving to the world a divided message on this important prophecy for the end times. And as I will show in a later statement, Heaven does have a problem with us doing this. So I'm going to be looking carefully into the visions to see if we can't get some help. My statement. Ellen White's statement that Daniel 11 has nearly reached its complete fulfillment implies that there is only one verse left to be fulfilled. This, in turn, implies support for the Eastern question. In a 1904 personal letter to Hiram A. Craw, Ellen White solicited a loan for one or two thousand dollars at low interest rate to invest in the work. Now that's about twenty-eight thousand to fifty-seven thousand, so this is not a little bit of money she was soliciting. In this letter she mentions the eleventh chapter of Daniel. And I believe that what she says about Daniel 11 confirms the correctness of the interpretation of Daniel 11, 40 through 45, that was being taught in the lecture on the Eastern question in Bible prophecy. Let's take a closer look at this uh, appeal to Hiram Craw. Quote, we have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of wars. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Ellen White wanted Hiram Craw to have a sense of the shortness of time, and so she says, we have no time to lose. And the prophecy that she knew that would best reveal where we were in the stream of time was the prophecy of Daniel 11. 
if Ellen White was absolutely clueless as to the identity of the kings of the North and the South in the final verses of Daniel 11, if she believed that there was only confusion in the church regarding these last verses, and that nobody understood this proph prophecy correctly, I seriously doubt if she would have used these verses as prime evidence that time was short. Now let me repeat myself. If she had any reservations or doubts as to what our church was teaching on Daniel 11, I don't believe that she would have used this prophecy as her key witness that time was short. Ellen White did not comment upon Bible truth of which she had no knowledge. She knew that our church was teaching that those last six verses of Daniel 11 were all about earthly civil warfare, as were the previous 39 verses. Perhaps that is why she said the world is stirred with the spirit of war just before she re refers to the final verses of Daniel 11. I believe that she knew that these verses were about civil warfare and not about the loud cry, Sunday laws, the papacy, or God's church. Now, here is the context of this statement. This letter was written to Hiram Craw on February 24, 1904. The adult Sabbath school lesson for the first quarter of 1904 was on the prophecies of Daniel. These lessons covered Daniel 11, 1 through 45, from the perspective of Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation, and Bible readings for the home circle. In the months of February and March, Ellen White, along with the World Church, would have been studying the Eastern Question in Lessons 9 through 11. In this context, it would have been obvious to church members what Ellen White meant by the phrase, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. By studying his Sabbath school lesson, Brother Craw would have believed that Ellen White was confirming that 44 verses of Daniel 11 had already been fulfilled in history and that only verse 45 was left to be fulfilled in order for the 11th chapter of Daniel to reach its complete fulfillment. By making this statement in the context of what was believed taught and published in the Sabbath School Lesson Quarterly, Ellen White certainly appears to be supporting the biblical interpretation of Daniel 11, 40 through 45, as found in the official publications of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at that time. In the November 1904 issue of the Review and Herald, remember this was in March, uh, earlier spring, then in November of that same year, Ellen White published this statement that had been sent in a personal letter to Hiram Craw regarding the shortness of time, that's Review and Herald Mar in November 24, 1904. Again, the fact that there is only one verse left to be fulfilled in the 11th chapter of Daniel and the prophecies of that last verse are directly connected with the close of human probation this final waymark fact is the prime evidence that God is using to tell us that the end is very near at hand. Because of the Sabbath school lesson earlier that year, supporting the interpretation of Daniel 11, 40 through 45 is taught in the Eastern Question in Bible Prophecy lecture that was being presented to the public across this nation, Ellen White would have been aware that this statement of hers would have been taken by the readers of her article as her endorsement of a contemporary Seventh-day Adventist view of Daniel 11, 40 through 45. In 1910, she again repeats this statement, once again affirming the denomination's view of Daniel 11, 40 through 45. That's in volume nine of the testimonies, page 14. When these statements about the 11th chapter of Daniel are coupled with Ellen White's three statements on the Eastern question, it becomes evident 
that the prophet of God endorsed the interpretation of Daniel 11, 40 through 45, as taught by our church for nearly 80 years. Okay, so that's my first statement, but I'm going to be giving my second statement because it is uh, directly related to that one. Statement five, three statements of the Eastern question. Ellen White's statement on the Eastern question imply support for this view. Her first statement, Sunday forenoon, Elder Smith spoke upon the Eastern question, just the subject the people wish to hear. Elder Smith improved the hour at five o'clock in addressing the large crowd upon the mark of the beast. Brother Haskell spoke in the evening to a large and attentive audience, and the great day of the meeting was over. Many had listened to the truth, and the day of final reckoning will reveal the results of that day's meetings. We hope and pray that the good seed sown may spring up and bear fruit to the glory of God. Ellen White includes the lecture on the Eastern question as being a message of truth and of being good seed that the people had listened to that Sunday. Now here's her second statement. We feel to thank and praise God that this large number could have a chance to hear the truth for themselves. Dr. Caro is now speaking at 5 o'clock p.m. upon the health question. Elder Daniel speaks this evening upon the Eastern question. May the Lord give his Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts to make the truth plain. This is in 1898. Four people spoke that Monday. Ellen White is writing this report while the third presenter, Dr. Caro, is speaking. Notice carefully this prayer of Ellen White's. May the Lord give his Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts, and I think it's the hearts of the presenters, to make the truth on what they were about to present plain to the hearts of the listeners, okay? She knew Elder Daniels very well. She had heard his presentation on the Eastern question many times before. She knew exactly what he was going to be presenting that evening and that he would be presenting truth to the people. And she was praying that Elder Daniel's heart would be inspired by the Lord's Holy Spirit to make this truth that he was about to present plain to the hearts of the listeners. Why would she want what Elder Daniels was about to present to be made plain? Because she knew exactly what he was about to present, and she wanted the listeners to hear and understand the truth that they were about to hear. Notice again Ellen White's statement where she includes by name the lecture of the Eastern Question and says, The listeners to this lecture and other lectures of that day listened to truth. Sunday forenoon, Elder Smith spoke upon the Eastern question. The great day of the meeting was over. Many had listened to the truth, and the day of final reckoning will reveal the results of that day's meeting. The plain reading of this second statement is stating that Elder Daniels was going to be teaching truth that evening when he presented the Eastern question lecture. This is the second time she calls the Eastern question truth, the first time being uh, the time Elder Uriah Smith presented this same lecture 21 years earlier in 1877. This lecture was presented at many of the camp meeting evangelistic endeavors from the 1870s through the early 1920s and is included what Ellen White characterized as truth. And that particular truth had power to open the eyes, ears, and mouths of outsiders, which brings us to our third and perhaps most significant statement. Our important meeting is now over. They estimate that we had from five to 8,000 people out, and the very best part of the community, I never addressed a more noble-appearing people. The evening meeting was largely attended, 
Elder Smith spoke with clearness, and many listened with open eyes, ears, and mouths. The outsiders seemed to be intensely interested in the Eastern question. He closed with a very solemn address to those who had not been preparing for these great events in the near future. So what are these great events in the near future of which the Eastern question speaks? Now, we have located over 850 newspaper reports of the Eastern Question lectures that Elders Daniels, Smith, and other ministers were presenting across the USA, Canada, and Australia over many decades, so we know exactly what was being taught with great clearness as truth, and it involved the historical recitation of the fulfilled prophecies of Daniel 11, 40 through 44, as presented in Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation. It also brought out the great events in the near future that involved the fulfillment of Daniel 11, 45 through 12, 1. These great events had to do with the future fulfillment of the last prophetic waymark of Daniel 11, the leader of Turkey planting the tabernacles of his palace in Jerusalem, then coming to his end, followed by the close of probation and the great time of trouble. Now, let me share something with you uh, that you might find surprising. I believe that the last power brought to view in Daniel 11 is the papacy. And that power of the papacy is brought to view in these words, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. The understanding that Smith had was that the leader of Turkey would come down, establish his uh, reign there in Jerusalem, and I believe that that'll be fulfilled when the leader of Turkey goes to Jerusalem, establishes the caliphate. And again, that's only a, a guess as to how it might happen. It's unfulfilled prophecy, so we don't know exactly what will happen until it happens. But I believe that it'll happen something like that. I believe after that happens, uh, and God won't allow that to happen until he pulls the trigger and says, time of the end is now. The end events are going to uh, go. And over in America, there will be terrible things going on. The people in the United States will demand of Congress to pass a Sunday law so we can get back to God so that the, uh, you know, the curse that we're under and, uh, can, can be taken off. And so, so now we have a national Sunday law here. And I believe shortly after that, Satan is going to personate Christ and he's going to appear from city to city because we're told that, that the rest of the nations will follow the example of the United States. And so Satan personating Christ, we're told, will go from place to place around the world and I believe he will be getting support for a universal Sunday law. And I believe that he will be uh, lifting up the papacy at this time as this was his right-hand man who changed the day to Sunday and that the Sunday's the right day. And he will go to Jerusalem as one of the spots where he'll be going. And of course, the caliph there in Jerusalem, he will bow at the feet of this Christ who has come. And there will be none to help him. El Shabad, uh, uh, Al Qaeda, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, all of them will be worshiping this Christ who is really the dragon. And so the dragon and the beast will be worshiped at the end. And the entire world will be united. And the power of the king of the north absolutely comes to his end. Nobody to help him because everybody is now worshiping the beast. And, uh, and, and they're worshiping the dragon. And Satan has everybody uh, f f worshiping him and following him. And it is at that point in time that, that probation closes. We don't know when probation closes, but it will close during the time when the papacy has universal sway over this world with Satan propping 
him up. So that's where I see the papacy being the final power in chapter 11. And, uh, and, and that king of the north has come to his end. Now, if she did not say that the lectures on the Eastern question were clear presentations of truth dealing with great events that were about to take place in the near future, then Daniel 11, 40 through 45, might very well have a different interpretation from what was being presented. Daniel 2, the first prophecy of the book of Daniel, is like an interstate highway map, a broad overview of the world kingdoms to come. Daniel 11, the last prophecy of this book, is like a city map. When you're getting close to your destination, you want to pull out the city map. The city map becomes present truth, and it is just what the people want to hear. When our pioneers went to a new territory, which chapter of Daniel do you think they used to capture the attention of the people? Yes, it was chapter 11. That prophecy was just what the people wanted to hear, as Ellen White reported. Now, I've experimented with this approach. On an Alaskan cruise that my wife and I were sent on, I gave the ship's activities director a copy of, of a book that I wrote, and I told him that I would be willing to give a lecture on the subject of this book. Now, that's all I said, and I didn't really expect that he would do anything about this, because if you've ever been on a cruise, uh, this is not what they do uh, on cruises. And so I thought, but what can hurt? Well, uh, now, um, I was very surprised when he contacted me and he was very interested in this subject, and he arranged for me to speak in one of the ship's premier lounges. Now, he put this short three-line advertisement in the ship's uh, newspaper. I didn't know what he was going to say or do, but he put this in. He said, lecture, Jerusalem Caliphate and the Third Jihad. Join fellow guest and author, Pastor John Whitcomb, for this lecture. Discover what the Bible reveals regarding the end game for the city of Jerusalem. Explores Lounge, Deck 7, Midship. Now, I was wondering if I would get a half a dozen people to show up in this lounge that sat over 250 people. And because... Uh, it's just the, people are busy doing other things. And, and what, was I ever surprised when, we, when the time came that the place was packed with people? Um, the lecture was just what the people wanted, and I might add, needed to hear. The ship's director was there, and he saw the interest of the people. He heard the applause. He saw the people come up afterwards. He thanked me on three different occasions. Now, a ship entertainer who had been on hundreds of cruises told me that he had never seen a Bible prophecy lecture given in one of the ship's premier lounges. He saw the interest that the people had, and he encouraged me to offer this lecture on other cruise lines. He said, you, you need to get this out. He says, there are, there are wealthy people, educated people on these cruises, and they're a captive audience, kind of, you know, for a while on, uh, uh, as it's going from port to port. And, and he says, the people can only take so much Elvis uh, you know, stuff, you know, uh, and, and that this was what the people need to hear, and, and they loved it. So um, the, uh, the, the literal view of Daniel 11, 40 through 45, is easy for the world to understand. I can even present it. It's an easy thing to share with people. They can readily see how history fits the prophecy, and they can see that verse 45 is on the verge of fulfillment. They don't have to try to figure out why we switch from a literal view to a symbolic view. They probably would not understand what the loud cry was all about or, or that the Seventh-day Adventist church was a glorious holy mountain. 
They, they might find it hard to follow our reasoning why the kings of the north and south are no longer kings, but religions are ideologies. In fact, it might be so hard for the common Joe to figure out what in the world we were talking about that some of us might just not, might be tempted to no longer present this prophecy to the general public. But if we do that, we lose one of our most successful entering wedge messages that our church has ever had. I wonder who might be happy with that. There was a reason why our pioneers used a literal view of Daniel 11 as an opening message in their evangelistic outreach. Because of its connection with the headline news, people naturally had an interest. And so my statement is Ellen White's statements on the Eastern question imply support for this view. Okay, I will begin uh, this statement with a, a little scenario. Let's say I was a literature evangelist, and I had read the statement that Ellen White wrote saying, Daniel and the Revelation and the Great Controversy, above all other books, are to be given to the people and get it out to the people. And then I had also read the statement that said, uh, that book, Daniel and the Revelation, will have the interest in that book will be until the close of probation. So now I got my marching order. So I get my I get a bunch of hardback copies of, of these two books, and I go into a community and I go door to door selling these beautiful books, these two books, urging the people the importance of these books, reading them. And after I'm done with that, then I do a mail out of paperback of these two books, getting in them into the homes of, uh, into their homes. And then I put an ad in the newspaper and um, with my picture of my face, so they know who I am. And I say, I am going to give a lecture at the local hall on Daniel 11, 40 through 45. Come out to hear it. And they read that in the newspaper and they say, oh, that's the guy who sold me these books. Oh, let me go read that. Let me read that uh, chapter. Let me read, read up on that. I, I want to go to that lecture. So they read the, in Daniel and Revelation, they read it and they say, wow, this is going to be really interesting. I want to go to that meeting. And so they all come out, the house is full. And when they come, I say, well, now let me teach you. Uh, I'm going to teach you what James White taught. And so the king of the north is a papacy and the glorious holy land is the United States. And the two seas are Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. And they're looking a little confused and they're saying, but, but the book you sold me has a different scenario. I say, yes, <laughs> yeah, he didn't know what he was talking about. Um, he was interpreting prophecy by the newspaper. Uh, so you just can't really uh, trust uh, Smith on that chapter. Okay, but they really liked what I presented, and they just bought into what I t taught them. And they go home. What do you think they will think of chapter 7 of Smith's book? What about chapter 8? What about Revelation 13? Do you think they would be interested in reading that book I don't think so. They won't have any confidence in the book that I sold them because if he's not right on this very important prophecy and they could see how important it is and if he messed it all up and you can't trust him, how can you trust him on any of the other prophecies? And so the book would have no interest. And yet that book is to have interest until the close of probation. But my lecture in that hall just destroyed interest in that book because I said, I am smarter than that book. Listen to me. I've got the truth on that. Okay, so that's the little scenario that will begin my statement. The statement is God desires his church to publicly speak 
with one voice on the major prophecies of the Bible, including Daniel 11.45, which is a prophecy that is directly connected with the close of probation. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there have always been a vari variety of histories applied to the various prophecies found in Daniel 11, 1 through 39. These prophecies, with these varying views, were never the burden of our public teachings. There will no doubt always be minor differences of understanding on many of these verses, and that is okay. These differences were not made apparent to the public because these verses were not generally used in public evangelism. The prophecies of Daniel 11, 40 through 45, were the ones widely used in the Eastern Question in Bible Prophecy Lecture. And because of our public use of these verses, it is necessary for us to speak with one voice. Revelation 10, 11 says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. It is reasonable to believe that God's church should be united on what they must prophesy again to the world. God wants us to give the same message when we present prophetic lectures to the world. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you perfectly join together in the same mind and the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Although possessing different temperaments and dispositions, they will see eye to eye in all matters of religious belief. They will speak the same things, they will have the same judgment, they will be one in Jesus Christ. Historical sketches, page 124. <clears throat> God does not require all of us to believe alike. He only requires us to speak alike. Let me support this statement. No one has the right to start out on his own responsibility <clears throat> and advance ideas in our papers on Bible doctrines when it is known that others among us hold different opinions on the subject and that it will create controversy. CW 74. You have departed from the positive directions of God that he has given upon this matter and only harm will result. This is not in God's orders. You have now set the example for others to do as you have done, to feel at liberty to put in their various ideas and theories and bring them before the public because you have done this. This will bring in a state of things that you have not dreamed of. It is no small matter for you to come out in the signs as you have done, and God has plainly revealed that such things should not be done. We must keep before the world a united front. Satan will triumph to see differences among Seventh-day Adventists, CW 75 and 76. My husband had some ideas on some points differing from the views taken by his brethren. I was shown that however true his views were, God did not call him to put them in front before his brethren and create differences of ideas. While he might hold these views subordinate to himself, once they're made public, minds would seize upon them and just because others believe differently would make these differences the whole burden of the message and get up contention and variance. 15 MR 21. James White had a view on Daniel 11 differing from his brethren, but neither the world nor the church was to have perceived this difference because he was to have kept his differing views to himself. And when James White violated this principle of action, God gave to Ellen White a message of rebuke to give to her husband, which he humbly accepted. Why did James White have to keep his view to himself, and yet Uriah Smith was given freedom to present his view far and wide? This is a very important question, and the answer will be extremely instructive to us today. The reason why 
was because Uriah Smith's view was the published view and was being, quote, taught by us as a people, close quote, across this land. It was the understanding that had been developed by a group of able Bible students who Ellen White says thoroughly examined the prophecies of the Bible and they were told by her to publish the results of these investigations to the world. Now, James White said that Uriah Smith's book was not the fruit of one mind or brain or however he said it because it was a, a, a joint effort. And uh, so she made this statement, I shared this uh, uh, earlier on, by the thorough investigation of the prophecies, we understand where we are in this world's history and we know for a certainty that the second coming of Christ is near. The result of these investigations must be brought before the world through the press. The evidence of our position have been increasing with every year. We have been receiving fresh assurance that we have the truth as revealed in the word of God that in accepting the third angel's message we have not given heed to fables but to the sure word of prophecy. We are now living in the full blaze of the light of Bible truth. That was in 1881. And this book that put into print these investigations was to continue presenting these specific prophetic views for as, quote, long as probationary time shall last, close quote. The interest in Daniel and the Revelation is to continue as long as probationary time shall last. God used the author of this book as a channel through which to communicate light, to direct minds to the truth. Shall we not appreciate this light, which points us to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King? 1 MR 63. The books Daniel and the Revelation, the great controversy, are the books which above all others should be in circulation now. Give them to the people light and truth they must have. Ellen White knew that even her book, The Great Controversy, could not take the place or do the work of Uriah Smith's book. His book contained valuable information that was not found in her book. She says everything that can be done should be done to circulate thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It is God's helping hand. Because Daniel and the Revelation is God's helping hand and it is to be widely circulated, James White was rebuked when he publicly presented prophetic views that were contrary to what was in Smith's book. Those who are preparing to enter the ministry, who desire to become successful students of the prophecies, will find Daniel and the Revelation an invaluable help. They need to understand this book. It speaks of past, present, and future, laying out the path so plainly that none need error therein. Those who will diligently study this book will have no relish for the cheap sentiments presented by those who have a burning desire to get out something new and strange to present to the flock of God. The rebuke of God is upon all teachers. They need that one teach them what is meant by the godliness and truth. The great essential questions which God would have presented to the people are found in Daniel and the Revelation. There is found solid eternal truth for this time Everyone needs the light and information it contains. Can you see just how easy God has made it for us to all speak with one voice on the prophecies of the Bible? God does not want us to be presenting conflicting views. We are required to speak with one voice. And what we are to speak to the church or to the public is only the prophetic truth as it has been taught by us as a people. Someday we shall see eye to eye. But in the meantime, we must only present one prophetic view, otherwise great harm will result. And she says, we shall see eye to eye ere long. 
but to become firm and consider your duty to present your views in decided opposition to the faith or truth as it has been taught by us as a people is a mistake and will result in harm and only harm, as in the days of Martin Luther, begin to draw apart and feel at liberty to express your ideas without reference to the views of your brethren and a state of things will be introduced that you do not dream of, 15 MR 20. Now, when everything is in dissension and strife, there must be decided efforts to handle, to publish with pen and voice these things that will reveal only harmony, 15 MR 21. Ellen White said that in this book, quote, there may be found matters of minor importance that call for careful study and correction, close quote. When something is found to be in error, it ought to be corrected. For example, Uriah Smith taught that the heavenly being in Daniel 10 was the angel Gabriel, when in fact it was Christ himself, according to Ellen White. This was cor corrected in the 1944 edition. Uriah Smith's book teaches that the power of Daniel 11.36 was a different power from the power brought to view in Daniel 11.30 through 35. One year after Uriah Smith's death, Ellen White penned a statement that indicates that the power spoken of in verses 30 through 35 is the same power mentioned in verse 36. These matters, she says, ought to be corrected. A, a team is to look at these things and make these changes, make no big deal about it. These changes do not affect the trajectory of the major prophecies, lines of prophecies. Uh, there, the angel being uh, Gabriel instead of Christ, uh, the being being Gabriel instead of Christ, doesn't change any trajectory of, of, a pro of, of the great lines of prophetic truth. And even uh, making that connect, that correction of seeing one power in verses 30 through 36 does not change the outcome of the line of prophetic truth. So in summary, God requires his church to present a united message to the world on Bible doctrines and prophecies. Number two, on account of the rebuke James White received from God when he presented a view contrary to Uriah Smith's view on Daniel 11.45, we are thereby instructed as to the view God permits his church to present to the world. Number three, because interest in Uriah Smith's book is to remain until the close of probation and because we are prohibited from presenting contradictory views to the public, prophetic views that conflict with the prophetic interpretations published in Daniel and the Revelation are not to be presented to the world. Number four, God desires to reveal advanced light on the prophecies, but very erroneous work has been done again and again, quote, I'm quoting, and will continue to be done by those who seek to find new light in the prophecies and who begin by turning away from the light that God has already given. Okay, so my statement is God requires his church to publicly speak with one voice on the major prophecies of the Bible, including Daniel 11.45, which is a prophecy that is directly connected with the close of probation. Okay, now I have one more statement I want to give, and then we'll take questions, okay? Because... Uh, yeah, I, I want to make sure I get this next statement in, okay? Because there might be some questions on this one. Write them down, save them. Okay. This one is, here's the statement. Satan is preparing the world for his personation of Christ. He knows the correct interpretation of Daniel 11.45. See, he's read Smith's book and has taken that interpretation and has connected a false narrative to its fulfillment. Now you listen carefully here. Perhaps you've heard of the New York Times best-selling author, Joel Richardson. 
he has published a book entitled The Mideast Beast. He published several other books, The Islamic Antichrist, When a Jew Rules the World, and many other books. Glenn Beck believes what Joel is teaching. Pat Robertson believes what he's teaching, promotes him. Jim Baker uh, promotes this. His views are becoming the dominant view in evangelical Christianity. I found the teachings of Joel Richardson. I find in the teachings of Joel Richardson Satan's strategy for preparing the world to receive him as the Christ when he pulls off his crowning act of deception, the personation of Christ. Satan must believe that the time for this event is near because he has selected a person and has given him a mission to promote a prophetic teaching that is currently capturing the attention of the evangelical world. Satan has studied the prophecies, and he is well aware of what they teach concerning the future. He knows that Daniel 11.45 teaches that the Islamic leader of Turkey will be coming to Jerusalem to establish his authority over this territory. So he has taken this fact regarding this future event and has placed a false narrative on the fulfillment of this prophecy. Here is that false narrative. Joel Richardson is teaching that the Antichrist is an Islamic leader from Turkey. In fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39, this Antichrist will set up his headquarters in Jerusalem. This will begin a spurious seven-year time period, and in three and a half years into this time period, quote, Christ appears, causes the Antichrist to come to his end, and begins, quote, his earthly reign over the nations. Richardson does not mention Daniel 1145 in this teaching. However, the fact is, a scenario similar to what he outlines will be taking place, according to Uriah Smith, in fulfillment of Daniel 11.45. The leader of Turkey, who is not the Antichrist, will go to Jerusalem and he will come to his end. And what brings him to his end? The prophecy does not tell us, but it is entirely possible that the arrival of Satan personating Christ could accomplish this. Islam is expecting the coming of Christ, and they believe that when he comes, he will rule the world. So the caliph caliph of Islam, who will be ruling from Jerusalem, would cease his rule by turning it over to this majestic being. Mind you, this is only one suggested scenario as how this final phrase of Daniel 11.45 might be fulfilled. Contrary to what Islam teaches, quote, Christ close quote, will not be converting the world to Islam. No, the world will not be honoring the Muslim Holy Day Friday, but rather the Papal Holy Day Sunday. The false Christ will extol the papacy and her day of worship. The Muslim world, along with everyone else except God's people, will be worshiping the dragon, Satan, and his agency, the beast, the papacy. So what Richardson is teaching will actually take place, as Satan very well knows it will. Satan is using the truth of what will actually take place according to Daniel 11.45 and is using this truth with a false narrative to establish his legitimacy when he personates Christ. I believe that Richardson's book, Mideast Beast, is a masterpiece of error channeled from Satan. And these books have become New York York Times bestsellers. Take a look at this short interview. And and I can see how you've been handpicked literally by God to give revelation of the end time. In fact, you were sitting among uh, 7,000 people. Get this, he's sitting around among 7,000 people, and the man that is speaking has a word of knowledge, but he starts out by even saying Joel's name. What did he say? Well, let me just back up a teeny bit. 
and make mention of something else. Just before my wife and I met, uh, there was a prophetess that prayed over my wife. And one of the things she said was she said, your husband, you will marry someone that will have significant insight into the end times and he'll release new prophetic understanding concerning the end times to the church and to the world. And so my wife and I are sitting in this meeting, 7,000 people, large civic center type of situation in the, in the very back. And before he spoke, he said, I want to share a prophetic word in order to show that what I'm about to speak on is from the Lord. He called us out by name, and then he spoke things to us that no man could know, things that we've been praying about, things that only we knew, that only the Lord, only God could reveal to a man. And that gets your attention. And then one of the things that he said was he said that the Lord was going to bring me into a season of divine revelation, which I knew intuitively was tied into this word about uh, understanding the end times. And, of course, I had no interest in the end times. I'm an incredibly unlikely candidate. Uh, my heart has always been to, uh, I love uh, sharing my Christian faith with Muslims, and I love reaching out to the poor. And I thought if I ever had a, a ministry, that that's what it would be geared toward. Uh, but somehow the Lord has managed to bring together this love for Muslims as well as this call to speak about the end times, and he's joined those two together. But what if everything we've been talked, taught about in series like The Left Behind or Late Great Planet Earth, the basic premises are wrong? What if? I believe God has raised up, Joe, people that understand his teaching, say for the first time, the whole end time scenario makes total sense to me. Uh, obviously, the Lord was speaking to us. And then among the things that he said was that the Lord was releasing me into a season of divine revelation, specifically because of years of waiting on the Lord uh, and, and developing and cultivating an intimate relationship. And, and you knew that divine revelation. What, what, was go what was exploding within you when he said that? Yeah, the moment he said that, I immediately, my mind was immediately moved to the prophecy that my wife had. And I knew that it had to do with uh, this revelation concerning the end times. And still, at that time, I thought, you know, it's going to have to be the Lord. But it was, it was shortly after that that, um, I guess I'll call it the divine downloads began to take place. And uh, you know it when it happens. You wake up, you read the Word, he opens up the Word. And there's just energy. There's energy on your Bible study. There's energy uh, and enlightenment on your mind, so to speak, as you consider world events. And uh, really, I, I've sort of been in that buzz, it seems as though, now for the past several years. Okay. He spends almost a year in the Middle East. He studies and it applies himself, as he should, but it's not a normal study. It's with revelation. These divine downloads that he calls that came to Joel came from the enemy of all truth whose power to deceive is tenfold greater than it was in the days of the apostles 2 SG 277 I believe that he is giving to the evangelical world through Joel Richardson an understanding of prophecy that corresponds with what will actually be taking place but with an interpretation of these events that is completely false. This prophetic deception hides the true identity of the beast, the horror of revelation and the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church. And with what better way than to predict future events that actually will take place, but with a false narrative attached to those events. The teaching that the Antichrist will come from Europe and rule from Jerusalem has been taught in the Christian world for decades. Ezekiel 38 and 39 are used to teach that at the end of time, this great army from Russia and Gog and Magog will sweep down upon Israel. Joel's Richardson's book is teaching that Gog and Magog are not Russia, but rather these re terms refer to Turkey. And as I already mentioned, he believes that these prophecy, uh, the prophecies teach that the Antichrist will be an Islamist from Turkey and will set up his seven-year reign in Jerusalem. He believes that this will be the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And of course, world conditions today favor Joel's views because Daniel 11 is indeed about to be fulfilled. 
Notice what Sheikh Raid Salis, a head of Islamic movement in Israel, said. Jerusalem will soon become the capital of the global caliphate. Compassion is coming. Justice is coming. World peace is coming. Prosperity is coming. They will come with the eminent caliphate, the capital of which will be the blessed Jerusalem. November 11, 2015, the Harriet Daily News report that Turks this time want this caliphate to be established and headquartered in Jerusalem during the inauguration of the 55th airport uh, in Hakkari province. Turkish President Erdogan spoke of his desire to conquer Jerusalem and to reestablish the Ottoman Empire. For st Satan's strategy to be most successful, he needed to get God's people to stop putting out the truth on Daniel 11, 40 through 45. He had to destroy the influence of Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation, which presents the true narrative of Daniel 11, 40 through 45. He had to get God's people to take up with other interpretations of this prophecy so that the world will believe that his prophets, Joel Richardson's narrative, is correct when Daniel 11.45 is actually fulfilled. However, God is bringing back to the forefront our church's historic view on Daniel 11.45. When the fulfillment of this prophecy takes place, God's people will be able to prov prov provide the correct narrative and tell the world that we have been teaching that this event would take place since 1872. I think this is a most serious development that has taken place. The Eastern question in Bible prophecy was first silenced in God's remnant church. The enemy of truth then raises up a messenger in the evangelical world who will teach the Eastern question in Bible prophecy, but with a completely false narrative that will prepare the world for his masterpiece of deception, the personation of Christ. It is time for God's church to unite together to counteract this work of Satan by reviving the message of the Eastern question in Bible prophecy that God gave to this church to proclaim to the world. So my statement, Satan is preparing the world for his personation of Christ. He knows the correct interpretation of Daniel 11:45 and has taken that interpretation and has connected a false narrative to its fulfillment.